Hey there, folks. How you doing? Today we're going to talk about um, something called stratigraphy. And within that, uh, we're going to talk about something called sedimentary structures. And this is meant to dovetail into your, um, well, sedimentary rocks conversation. Uh, I realized this semester we had um, metamorphic rocks in between. That's not always the case. Um, but um, so, yeah, take to it uh, with regard to that. And um, one of the things that I want to reinforce is uh, where sediment comes from. All right. Where sediment comes from. And um, had I done another lecture first, you would know about something called the agents of weathering and erosion. All right, the agents of weathering and erosion. Uh, somebody remind us, first of all, what weathering does. Like, what was the definition? We touched on it briefly with rock cycle. Weathering does what with regard to sediment? All right, it breaks it down. It makes it. We can make it even simpler than that. Weathering produces sediment. All right, it, weathering is the process by which rocks are broken down. That's very true. We're going to keep it super simple. Weathering makes sediment. So what does erosion do then with regard to sediment? It moves it. Right. All right. So weathering makes sediment or produces sediment. Erosion transports or moves sediment. So the agents of weathering and erosion, all right, are <clears throat> these forces at work at the surface of the earth that break down and move stuff. And I'm going to tell you four things. And since they're both agents of weathering and erosion, the implication is then that um, they do both. What weathers can erode, and while you're eroding, weathering happens, and so on and so forth. So they are, and we had another sing-songy thing the other day. We had boulder cobble, pebble, sand, silk, clay, remember that? All the class sizes, the sediment sizes. Well, now we have one more sing-songy thing. And, and I'd like to think that helps you remember them for the test. Uh, wind, water, ice, and gravity. Well, that doesn't exactly roll off. Doesn't it? Wind, water, ice, and gravity. I don't know. Kind of does. Could be more awkward. Wind, water, ice, and gravity. And those are four forces, uh, again, that we call the agents of weathering and erosion. It's really easy to think about them as agents of erosion, the wind blows things, the water flows things, stuff falls, that's gravity, um, um, ice, we're talking usually uh, with transportation, we're talking about stuff getting stuck in a glacier like a giant jello mold, all right, um, so erosion is fairly simple, the weathering part when we get to that conversation is a bit more involved, but suffice it to say, wind uh, and, and water and, and gravity, really easy to think about. Um, through those three forces, we can break up smaller and smaller and smaller sediments, okay? As wind blows something into something else, um, you may have heard of sandblasting. Uh, sometimes they do that to clean buildings. Well, Mother Nature invented that, okay? Uh, blowing sand through deserts and beaches. Uh, water. You ever pick up a rock in the water? It's almost always smooth and rounded, right? And whether that's waves rolling back and forth or that's a stream flowing downhill, that rock is constantly tumbling in there like a rock tumbler. Um, and that smooths it out. That's weathering. Gravity. Stuff falls downhill. Uh, my favorite. I grew up watching Roadrunner and Coyote all the time. I know you guys kind of know who they are. Um, but, I mean, that was that was my lifeblood. Kind of like maybe SpongeBob for you guys. I don't know. Um so one of my favorites was he was always trying to squish himself a roadrunner, right? That was like the entirety of, of everything. So he finally had all his measurements right. He did his, his coyote calculus and this, that, and the other thing. And everything was right. He had his giant boulder. And for once, the laws of physics actually kicked in, weathering and erosion, if you would, uh, loosely attached to there. Because he th 
let that giant boulder roll down the hill and it bounced and rolled and bounced and rolled and bounced and rolled. And by the time it got down to the bottom, it was a tiny little pebble because all of the pieces had broken off of it. And just this little thing of pebbles rolled by the roadrunner as he was eating his bird seed. That's gravity. All right, things move downhill. So that's how we get sediment. All right. Yeah, there's that whole thing where it grows in water. We're, we're not going to worry about that. But, but that, that, there's that too. I just want to remind you before we got truly started here, uh, just a little preface, if you would, um, on what what's going on. So you've been staring at this slide for five minutes and 35, 36, 37 seconds now. What are you looking at? Rocks. That doesn't quite win you the brownie there. Rocks and sand. All right. What kind of rocks? <laughs> Sedimentary rocks. Good. Anybody want to kick that up one more notch? Went from rocks and sand to sedimentary rocks. Let's let's put those two words together and maybe tell me what kind of sedimentary rock we're looking at. Hmm. Yay. Sandstone. All right. And you've seen if you've been anybody been out west. Not always, but sometimes we'll get somebody out west ish. Okay. Um, too young to remember or not quite out west? I don't wear Well, where you see rocks like this. No, okay. Yeah, so if you get out west far enough, um, there's, there's, there's rocks like this all over. Utah, Nevada, um, you know, a handful of them, even to the Dakotas um, in, in some places, and, and many more, you know, California, parts of all over over there. Um, it's rocks, rocks, rocks. It looks exactly like Roadrunner and Coyote, okay? So uh, we see this stuff, and we assume that the processes of uh, wind, water, ice, and, and or gravity, right, uh, made this because I just told you all about that for the first five minutes of class, right? So this is somewhere out there. Except that it ain't. This is Mars, all right? And um, that is cool on so many levels. Uh, I don't know if you guys ever see the Mars rover. Um, I'm old. I still do Facebook. I imagine they're on Instagram. I don't know if they're on the Snappity Chat and whatnot. But um, the Mars rover sends back uh, images. We've got a, a, an awesome little droid on the surface of Mars. And he sends back these, these pictures that wherever you turn your phone, it, it makes a diorama of literally just the, if you were there turning them, you know, with a, a, a knob or a joystick. Uh, you can look up, down, left, right. Uh, it's just amazing. And it looks exactly like Nevada. All right. It looks exactly like what you've been looking at here. These are sedimentary rocks. Do we have any reason to believe that there's another way to create sedimentary rocks? Um, well, the answer is no, but there could be another way to make sedimentary rocks. But as far as, as we understand, and because of a whole lot of other features that we found there, um, what does this tell us about Mars? There was water at some point. There was wind. There's an atmosphere on Mars. There, there's gravity. Yeah. All right. So there's three things we know about Mars. Now, we knew a handful of those already. We could make some assumptions. But the idea that we would get there and find layered sedimentary rocks exactly like we find here on Earth and we'd see the exact same features. Uh, I'm going to say like alluvial fans and deltas, things that streams make. Um, we're going to see weaving away canyons and stuff like that that water and wind make. That's really freaking <coughs> awesome. All right. And um, if you could track down some of these Mars rover pictures, I, I think you'll be, even if you don't even dig geology, just the idea that it is so amazingly similar to what we have here, or at least at some point it was. Now, I grew up, I don't know if I have one more of these or not. Yeah, here's another one. So that, that initial one we were looking at. Um, I grew up in the, I don't want to say the golden age of conspiracy theories, but boy, people believed in everything back in the 70s and the 80s, okay? And, um, you know, 
there there's a, a handful of things you always wonder about. And we've heard some tiny little bits about life on Mars. And, uh, you know, we've got this and it might be that, and a little bit of this it might be a fossil. Uh, we, don't, we don't know. If we're going to find it, it's going to be in sedimentary rocks. That's what's even cooler, cooler about this. Um, more than likely, again, if you go back to something we talked about earlier in the semester, the solar nebula theory, um, where we assume that Mars and the Earth have the same birth date, um, if we can assume that, uh, uh, again, the processes that, that occur here occur in similar rates on other similar planets, um, we could assume that the rate of evolution uh, was probably the same as well. So what you find yourself asking is how far along did they get before they lost their water? How long did they have a thick enough atmosphere to maybe have uh, an ozone layer? And, and so on and so forth, and so to not radiate the hell out of uh, whatever might have been trying to grow on that planet and to keep it watered and, and so on and so forth. And the answer is probably not horribly long. Um, we'll see. We'll see. I would love it as much as anyone if they cracked open one of those things and found a trilobite or something in there. I mean, that'd be, that'd be super cool. Um, we probably have a much better chance of, of seeing uh, extremophiles, remember we talked about extremophiles a little bit, these things that grow at the bottom of the ocean and inside volcanic, uh, inside of volcanoes. All right, it's, it's a hardy type of bacteria. I imagine that's definitely there. But um, not the little green men we were looking for, right? So we'll see. Eventually they will tell us something. Um, but why we haven't heard much yet, you know, you got to wonder sometimes. And again, that's where I get back to the whole conspiracy thing. Maybe they found something really big, you know, dinosaur bone. Um, but uh, we'll see. We'll see, we'll see, we'll see. So why are we talking about Mars? Why are we talking about fossils? Well, we're talking about Mars because, again, it is a sister planet, um, a brother planet in this case. Um, and it is a terrestrial planet. And again, owing to solar nebula theory, we can assume that the processes we talk about on Earth at some point applied there as well. We're able to talk about fossils and whatnot being stuck in these sedimentary rocks because that's actually half the point of this lecture. So let's come back down to Earth. So, from what we just saw on um, Mars and what we've been seeing on Earth since we've been paying attention is that sediments uh, are deposited in, in flat, horizontal layers, okay? Um, just like pages in your book, uh, your notebook, your textbook, wh whatever. Uh, just like dust on your TV and windowsills and bookshelves and wherever. Dust piles up, layer on top of layer on top of layer. Dust is a great analogy, I suppose. I mean, it is sedimentation, but you don't really think about it that way. Um, because if you're like the Joppos, you don't really dust that frequently. Um, if you could go in there with a teeny tiny microscope, you would be able to see layers. And if you just want to try, one thing you can do, of course, is is dust, come back a week later, dust again, come back a week later, dust again. Do it like for a month. And then imagine that all four of those layers of dust you erased uh, piled up on one another. Okay? They, that would be there. So sediments are deposited in layers. And you're saying, but wait a minute, I know I've seen rocks that look like roller coasters. Very true. Very true. When you see that, and they're sedimentary rocks, um, you're looking at plate tectonics -y kind of stuff happening, okay? Some squishing that made them bend, and so on and so forth. Um, because of a handful of rules you'll see a little later in here, um, primarily because of gravity, 
stuff floats down to the bottom. Even in a, a lake or a pond, you could imagine a lake or pond you've seen, and you know there's a gentle slope in and so on and so forth. It's not lined evenly with sediment. It actually rolls down to the bottom and piles up from there. Again, be, because of gravity. So um, sediments are deposited in layers. All right. We call these layers beds or bedding planes. You're going to see that in the book a lot. I just stick with layers. Occasionally, I'll say the word strata. All right. And uh, that was the name you saw on this opening slide a couple minutes ago. Stratigraphy, stratigraphy, right? Strata, that's those layers. So we're studying the layers in stratigraphy. All right. There's some on good old Earth. And basically, when you see the colors change, you, you know for sure you're swapping layers. All right. But you could also assume that as we go up through, where's Mousy? There's Mousy. Up through here, when maybe even color change isn't too obvious, that if you were to walk in close enough, you would see um, layering. All right. And just in case for some strange reason it doesn't show up as a slide, I want to just take one moment and say something that's not on the slides right now. These layers, these strata, these beds, they represent time. All right? We gave you the dusting example. If you dusted away every week, you wouldn't have any dust there. If you let it pile up, you'd have three weeks' worth of dust, right? Right there. Let's assume that only makes three layers. That represents a time when you did not dust. So when these sediments build up in layers, they represent time that sediment was building up. So these rocks are time. So we're going to be touching on that over and over and over again. Like I said, I'm sure... There's a slide coming up about that, but just in case, for some weird reason, I'm going to get that out there sooner rather than later. So, this is, well, I know you're all going to write it all down, so take a 30 seconds here, write it down, and then I'll talk to you. So our dusting example, again, you have three weeks where you didn't dust, and let's assume that each of those weeks equals a layer, shall we? All right, so we have three layers of dust on your mantle of your fireplace, and I'm going to ask you which layer of dust is the oldest, the top, the middle, or the bottom? Nice and loud. The bottom. All right. Now, would you have known that without just having written this down? Yeah. All right. Of course you would have. I, I would hope. Um, there's a handful of what I like to call, well, duh, moments in this lecture. But somebody had to put it down. Somebody got to call it something. Somebody had to say, hey, what we've been paying attention to and, and noticing all this time is actually kind of important. We better make note of it. And, well, let's give it a vocabulary word. And superposition is the perfect example of that. All right. Uh, another way to think about it, let's say uh, you've got a place at your house where all your mail comes in. All right. And all week, you, you grab the mail, you pull out any bills, you throw everything else on the table. Let's just say it's a table. By the end of the week, hungry for a pizza, you say, hey, I think some coupons came in on, uh, on Monday or Tuesday. Where are you going to look in that pile? Are you going to look on the top of the pile or are you going to look on the bottom of the pile? Bottom of the pile. All right? You know superposition. It makes sense. Why are the rocks on the bottom older than the rocks on the top? 
because they were there first. All right, that that's why. Now, there are ways to mess with this. Of course, igneous intrusions are a great example. Igneous intrusions could weasel their way in anywhere and throw that giddy wumpus. All right, but generally speaking, this is a great rule and best example of this of course is with sedimentary rocks all right but it's not all sedimentary rocks out there we get it but if you start with sedimentary rocks which are at the surface just about everywhere then you can squeeze in everything else and and, and understand how it fits now let's say your dog comes along throws her paws up on the table knocks everything onto the floor you pick it all up you're saying lots of nice things to the dog for making a mess and you put it back on there and now where are those coupons who knows right all right that's plate tectonics that's that's the thing that bends and weaves and shuffles things on top of one another breaks rocks slides them around that's plate tectonics that's after the fact and that too tells us something if you see a layer of sandstone and limestone looks like a roller coaster. You knew a couple of things happened. You knew, first of all, that the sandstone got laid down. Maybe a beach, maybe a desert, right? Think of all the places you know where sand lives. Then we had limestone. You know limestone only forms in oceans. And then they're all wrinkled. And then you're like, okay, so we had some sort of plate tectonical event here. You just went and made a really brief but accurate history of that rock outcrop over a certain amount of time. All right, really kind of simple. Sometimes much harder than the CSI stuff on TV, sometimes a little easier. So this comes after principle of superposition. Um, I guess we're to imply here that the rocks on the top are younger than the rocks on the bottom. That's a pretty good guess. Um, one of the things you do have to account for is um, gravity, rocks fall. So you got this bunch of stuff here. It's slightly lighter colored. You can see it down here. That's all sediment that has broken off of these rocks over the years. Okay. And actually, it can cause some problems. Um, I think they're still arguing over this. But this represents a fairly huge chunk of time when you find a cliff like this. Okay. And um, again, time has been going on ad nauseum for, for you know, forever. Four and a half billion years we've been having time. Now, we haven't had critters that long, mind you, but we still had critters a very long time. And there was a fossil that had, this is the argument at any rate, fallen out of a cliff, weathered and eroded out of a cliff, much higher up, and fell down, got re-lithified with new sediment that built back up, turned into sandstone again. And somebody was trying to argue that, um, arguing superposition, for example, that this is way lower in the rock record, uh, therefore, uh, this dinosaur was much older than, than we previously thought it was. Someone else is like, no, look at the condition of this stuff. Look where it is. Da, 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 da. So um, there's, there's, there are some ways to, to throw a, a wrench into the works. Um, and like I said, I don't know if they ever did sort that out. But looking at something like this, you could easily perhaps imagine how that could happen. But again, generally speaking, we don't want to talk about the specifics. That's for like senior level stuff. And we throw all those weird little what ifs at you. Got to learn the basic rules first. Probably in Chem 101, they don't tell you what I did about the electrons blipping in and out of existence. They say, no, electrons live in nice, happy little shells, right? They tell you about the weird stuff later. Now, maybe your teacher told you, I don't know. But got to learn the basics before you could learn the exceptions. So we go from principle of superposition to the principle of original horizontality. And yeah, Spellcheck does not like the word horizontality. 
but it is, at least in geology, a word. And this tells you what I've been telling you for the last 20 some odd minutes. That sediments are deposited in horizontal layers. Qualifier though. In an aquatic environment, sediments are deposited in horizontal layers. And that's because of what I told you with the gravity and picture your pond and the sediment rolling to the bottom of the pond. But that's important because at some point we're going to show you a lithified, remember lithified means turn to rock, we're going to show you a lithified sand dune. And this lithified sand dune has sand, blow, uh, sandstone layering in 23 different directions. And what that represents is the change in wind patterns over, over time. But they sure as heck aren't in nice horizontal layers. So again, if we realize that this happens only in aquatic environments, um, first of all, that tells us that, let's go back to when we didn't know that was a sand dune. We'll say, okay, uh, this probably wasn't in an aquatic environment. Where else are we going to find sand? And, and so on and so forth. So all these little things are, are, are tips or tricks or tools. So now, what do we need to infer? We need to infer that when these rocks were laid down, the whole damn area was underwater. Or at least should be. You, you can occasionally get horizontal layers on, on dry land. But, because again, we have gravity. Pebbles roll downhill. But luckily, because of fossils and stuff like that, we could reinforce that by saying, oh, yeah, there's some seashells in those rocks. It's definitely underwater. At least saying those rocks were underwater. All right, this one's a little more complex. This is definitely not a wool duh. So if you don't quite process this one, don't worry about it. Uh, sometimes it does take a little time. So a principle of lateral continuity, lateral means reaching out, spread out, kind of all around you sort of thing. All right, is what we mean by this. Continuity means, you know, continuous, the same. So you all know we're in a valley here, right? We're in what they call the Mohawk Valley, and that's because of a river called the the Mohawk River, right. So you can't really see both sides at once, but again, you are familiar with the fact that if you go up, excuse me, roughly northish, you leave the valley and you got some rocks there. Uh, you're probably also familiar with, you might not have done it though, if you go south, you're going to come back up out of the valley and you got rocks there again, right? So now, we need to mentally take that river and all the rock in between, which if you've driven it, that's, that's a hell of a lot of rock. And we're going to put it all back in place, and we're going to put that river right back up on top before there was a valley. We're able to do that because of this definition, or this idea, and even now, when you find yourself at the bottom of the valley, again, you'll want to get on your donkey and go check. But you got a pretty good idea that when you look up to the north and see those rocks, and you look down to the south and you see those rocks, and you realize that you're in a river valley at the bottom, that the rocks to the south and the rocks to the north are the same dang rocks. Pretty good chance. And it's just that this river wore down in between them. You follow me? All right. Now, let's see if I have a picture here. 
All right. So what we're saying is that those rocks that we see in the distance uh, are probably um, going to have a mirror behind, you know, on your guys' side of the screen. And that this cool little arch and everything in between is also made out of that rock. That's lateral continuity. It tells us that as far, as far as you look around and you see similar looking rock, you're fairly safe to assume um, that it is the same, same rock. That's me, by the way, there uh, for scale. Um, I did manage to hike that. Uh, nearly gave me a heart attack. Um, that was about, well, for me, about two hours in. Uh, for most tourists, it's probably about half that. Uh, I did that. I was lucky enough to go out there a couple summers ago. That's Arches National Park in Utah. Um, and trust me when I say it looks very similar to Mars. <laughs> uh, they always joke about people, uh, well, some people aren't joking, but faking the moon landing. Um, it'd be very easy to fake the Mars landing. Huh? It was fake. Okay. Yeah, no. But the Mars one, good God, you just have to drive to Utah, definitely. You don't even have to use black and white film. Yes, ma'am. No, it's 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 big. Uh, I forget how tall that arch. That's the great arch. That's sort of the not the point of the place, but that's like the the thing. It's a really tall arch, and it won't be there eventually. Um, the my my wife or whoever my son maybe took this picture. Um, Somebody from the scout troop was fairly far away from me as well. Um, there's some really uh, more pictures to get it into scale. I don't think they're included in here. Um, but, uh, but it's tall. It's tall. And I chose this one, uh, you know, for, for that reason. Um, it's, it's a pretty amazing view. But, uh, but, yeah, so lateral continuity at any rate. The far rocks, everything in the middle and then the side that you can't see uh, is all connected. And the reason that is, uh, I've been telling you how much that rocks are, are time. We've been saying it, but I haven't used these words. Rocks are a product of an environment, okay? Fairly easy when we talk about um, basalt, a lava, okay? Or rhyolite, a, a lava. You know that's from a volcano. You find that somewhere. There was a volcano here. It had to be. But all the other rocks, you kind of just take it for granted. And why wouldn't you? They're, they're, they're rocks. Um, but there was an environment that produced layered sand, which eventually became sandstone. And that environment, everywhere that environment was, we should find that rock. Now, the extension of this is, just to go back for a moment, all right, it goes until it ends. Wow, that's deep, right? Well, it is and it isn't. Um, at some point, it's going to stop that environment and turn into a different environment. Uh, a, a beach is a great example. Uh, like I said, most people have been to some form of a beach, even if it's... Uh, you know, a lake sort of park and, and so on and so forth. You've got um, the water. You've got the sand right on the beach. You've got back beach where the dunes and the scrub and whatnot are. And then you got parking lot. Well, before there was parking lot, there was more vegetation and so on and so forth. You've just passed through four different environments in a very short stretch, all right? But nature's huge, she's, you know, big. Um, going back to this, okay? At some point, we're gonna stop producing sand and maybe we're gonna move into sort of that gravelly parking lot area. It's a different environment. So that sandstone goes until it ends uh, and then something else will, will pick up. So lateral continuity actually has a lot of uses. Um, it doesn't get the respect it deserves in uh, 101, um, but, uh, but yeah. All right, this is actually two um, definitions 
they're very similar, so I, I always throw them together. Um, principle of cross-cutting relationships and principle of inclusions. All right. Um, you'll see how they're similar in a moment. But So principle of cross-cutting relationships, the disrupted pattern is older than the disruption. The disrupted pattern is older than the disruption. Uh, what the heck does that mean? Well, can you cut through a field that isn't there? No, right? It's that simple. Um, something has to be there for it to be uh, disturbed. <laughs> What's the point? The point is that let's say we found any one of these rock faces, these cliffs I've shown you, all right? And cutting across any one of those is a big black igneous intrusion. What was there first? That igneous intrusion or all that rock that it's cutting through? What's older, what's younger? Okay, the rock that it's cutting through is older. It was there first, it couldn't. That igneous intrusion wouldn't have been able to go up into air, just as an example, okay? So that rock had to be there. Why do we care? Well, again, it is some people's jobs out there, believe it or not, to tell us the ages of the rocks that are out there and in the order that they're in and so on and so forth. So it really helps them along um, when they're, they're doing this job if there's a couple of, uh, and this one I think kind of falls under, well, duh, as well. Okay, uh, if there's a couple of these moments where we have to say, well, yeah, of course that rock was there first. And that's why, um, you know, if you ever were to get some simple little aging problem with rocks in it, okay, igneous isn't always a, a given. You, you need to ask yourself, is it an intrusion or is it a lava flow? Because if it's a lava flow, well, those have to happen at the surface, right? So if, let's just say, uh, I shouldn't have said vertical. If we had made it horizontal, we could just flip it super easy. Um, let's say it was a horizontal intrusion. You looked at it. It was uh, fairly coarse grained. So you're like, oh, this is a sill. Remember, sills were parallel to the, to the rock layers, okay? So that means it came after the sandstone or whatever was there. But how, what if you go and look at it and you find out that it's a very, very, very fine grained rock? an ex extrusive rock. Well, that changes your ordering of those layers very much so. It went all the sandstone below it, then you had a volcanic event, and then you went back to making sandstone again. So, it does, does matter with, with that. So, cross-cutting relationships, all right? Principle of inclusions, as I said, is rather similar uh, except in this case, it's the uh, inclusion is older than what it's included in. Huh. Well, what came first, the chicken McNugget or the chicken? Probably the chicken or the egg. I know, but not in this example. So what came first? The chicken. The chicken. All right. So if you have a nugget in your hand, um, you know that... Uh, for some reason you're trying to age date that nugget. I don't know why. Um, you would know that um, more than likely uh, you're going to get some some old ages in there. Where this comes into to play is a really bad example with the chicken nugget and the chicken there, sorry. Where this comes into play is that um, we've been mentioning dating rocks, okay, and um, sedimentary, for as awesome as they are, is, is everything else they are to do for, um, they suck for putting dates on. Absolutely stink. Because what are they made up of? Pieces, parts of a gajillion different rocks. So if you send a hunk of sandstone off to the lab, you're going to get 12 different dates if you pay for 12 different tests, more than likely. Now what you can do with that is say, okay, it's no older than this, it's no younger than that. You could get a bracket. 
So this kind of goes back to that, that dinosaur example that fell down the hill and got reburied. Dinosaur could be the inclusion there. <coughs> so principal inclusions, uh, the pieces parts are going to be older than the whole. That's what it boils down to. And this is why when they're going back also and trying to find um, rocks to, to date the earth on, that we're looking at sedimentary and we're just trying to hope, needle in a haystack, you know, who's got the oldest pieces part in a sedimentary rock so far? That's where these, these numbers are coming from. Um, because more than likely they're either incredibly buried, the or original, in quote, rocks, um, or they've been worn away and re-included into sedimentary rocks so many times, you know, even God lost count a thousand years ago kind of thing. Um, nobody knows. Nobody knows. So we're looking for, for, for literally just these tiny little pieces in, in, in other rocks. So it's still, say, worthwhile dating sedimentary rocks. But, um, and yeah, there's a million jokes about dating rocks and geologists. But, um, but putting a date on a rock is, uh, is, is tricky, can be tricky. Uniformitarianism, this one I'm pretty sure you had in earth science, I don't know if you had these others or not, but um, present is the key to the past, that's what they always whittle it down to, uh, and that's, that's kind of a serious understatement. Uh, I actually started this conversation uh, 40 minutes ago uh, with the principle of uniformitarianism, I just didn't announce it as such. I remember when I said we have every reason to assume that the processes that happen here on Earth um, occurred on a similar planet, you know, next to us. That's an extension of, of uniformitarianism. On Earth, it is meant that stuff we see happening now more than likely occurred in the past in the same way. Gravity has always behaved in the same way. Um, air masses have always behaved in the same way. Water has always been liquid, solid, or gas, and flowed downhill, and, and so on and so forth. All these things we could take for granted, hopefully should be able to take for granted. And why that's beneficial is because we can observe now. We can't observe the past, right? We can only watch what's happening now. So if we see these processes doing these behaviors, well, we could look and, and see in what they produce. Copper, weathering, so on and so forth. We could assume that um, if we find some ancient copper, you know, in, in a rock, that it formed in the same way. And, and it could extend that to anything. So what it allows us to do is unwrap these, these mysteries we find in these other rocks by saying, okay, well, nowadays, this is how it works. Let's just start with the assumption that that's how it worked then, too. Now, you may find something to, to, to argue with that, and most scientists are open-minded enough to almost get excited about that, say, holy crap, did I discover a new process that only happened six million years ago? Wow, that'd be neat. They're thinking they're going to get published, so they, they want to find something odd. But, you know, nine times out of ten, 9.9 .9 times out of ten, this is exactly, um, you know, what you see is what you got. All right. No more rules and laws for a little bit. Let's change gears a little and um, talk about naming rocks. And not just sandstone and limestone, but, uh, but Stinky, Stewie, and, and George, and Stevie. Um, giving them real names. So, you remember the layers, the beds, right? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, bless you. If you just have one type of rock, shale, and it was first found and most prevalent in Utica, New York, 
more than likely, that's going to be called the Utica Shale. You don't get to name it after yourself, usually. You name it after where it's found. Because you want to be helpful. It isn't the Nick Shale or the Giapo Shale. That really doesn't tell people much except who found it. And I probably really wasn't the first person to find it. But if you say the Utica Shale, you say, oh, where'd you find that? Utica. What kind of rock is it? Shale. Oh, cool. It's useful. Now, the fact that, and I found this out many years later, the fact that the Utica Shale happens to be what my cousin in Ohio, uh, when fracking was still going on, was tapping for fracking, that was kind of interesting. It's not at the surface there, so that's why they didn't really name it, but they knew what, what rock layer they were hitting. So these things can go long distances, but it's where they're out at the surface and people find them. You'll see in a moment a picture. I'm sure I'm still using it. You're going to see the Kaibab limestone. Well, Kaibab is, I believe, somewhere in California, okay? And somebody found a nice outcrop of it there the first time, the original time, in Kaibab county or the town of kaibab and uh what kind of rock is it well it's a limestone and so that goes on forever however sometimes um rocks occur in sequence over and over and over again i've talked to you several times i know about limestone and shale right limestone and shale is a sequence you see all the time you see it uh here on the throughway uh, by the little falls exit you got all this black rock and then every so often there's a little bit of cream and then there's all that black rock, and then there's a little bit of cream. That's called a formation. When you have some rocks that occur in, in, in sequence, in a series, all right, and for whatever reason they're, they're well-known or people have reason to know them, then we call them the something formation, the little falls formation. I'm making that one up, okay? Albany formation is on here. I don't know if that's a real one or if I made that one up myself. Utica Shale is real. Um, so that doesn't tell you a whole lot. That tells you, well, it tells you two things. It tells you that it's not just one type of rock, and it tells you where to, to look for it. Okay. Um, so whenever you see the word formation, that tells you that there's multiple rock types involved, and the sedimentologists, the people in charge of this stuff, have probably a fairly good reason for grouping them so. The Utica Shale over here um, shows a transgression and regression of shoreline, okay, on an ancient sea. Shale is shallow water, limestone is deeper water. So in that one spot where that mile marker is, four hundreds, we'll say thousands of years, it was shallow enough that it produced shale. Then for whatever reason, it rained a lot, let's just say, that's a silly answer, but it rained a lot, sea level rose, and at that mile marker where it had been for thousands of years, shallow enough only to make shale, well now it's deep enough to make limestone for just a short period of time, because there's only a little bit of limestone there. And then shoreline moves back, and you're making mud again there, you're making your shale again. So that marks a happening in time, a, a moment in time when, when the sea level was moving back and forth, and it's a fairly great example of it there. So that's worth giving it a formation name. Follow? So that's, you'll see, if you find yourself in the world of studying rocks. So as I gave you, we've got the Kaibab limestone. We've got the... Toroweep formation. Well, what's in the Toroweep formation? We don't know, um, but it is um, found a great example of it in Toroweep, wherever that happens to be. What's underneath there? The Coconino sandstone. All right. Well, we can make a possibly decent guess at what's happening in the Toroweep. We might be seeing a transition uh, from sandstone to limestone. Okay. We might see a handful of rocks in there. 
Uh, but nowadays you would Google Torah weep formation. You'd find out exactly what it is. In the olden days, you'd have to go to the, uh, again, I'm going to assume this is Colorado. I think it is. Um, Col Colorado Geological Survey, pull up the, uh, the, the paper that was written about that area and find out what it is. Googling is, is so nice nowadays. Um, and you probably could, let's prove me wrong. Come on, Internet. You folks at home, the uh, screen's kind of small. There we go. Torah Weep Formation, Middle Permian, which is a time period. Kaibab, Coconino, how about that? God bless the Internet. All right. Uh, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. Is it in Colorado? Oh, Arizona. I was close. Colorado River. I knew there was Colorado in there somewhere. All right. So at any rate, so now you could go. And so what is it? It is uh, between the brightly colored units of the Kaibab limestone above and the Coconino sandstone below. Uh, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. Gypsum and shale with also sandstone. All right. Gypsum, we know, is an evaporite. Remember, we talked about that the other day. So we're going to find that in areas where there's water and then no water, water, then no water. That sounds like a shoreline as well. Uh, shale, you know, is mud. So, yeah, that all kind of makes sense. Very cool. All right. So, we name groups of rocks. We not only date rocks, we name them. It helps when dating. You saw some black lines in between the formations, in between the rock types. We call those contacts. Believe it or not, you can just study contacts. Contact is the boundary between two different, that says formations. It doesn't have to be a formation. It could just be, again, Utica shale, just two different types, okay? And if you remember that rocks are a product of their environment, what that tells us is that that, that contact, that bedding plane, that last bed of sandstone before it becomes shale, is a change in environment. It's a moment in time. Now, was it as fast as my finger snapped? No, probably not. But, you get my point. Now, here's the rub. Let me see if I have a special slide for unconformities. I do. Sometimes that contact can be what we call an unconformity. And unconformities do not conform. No, that's not what it means at all. <coughs> you got to look carefully at the rocks above and below a contact. And again, it doesn't help that sedimentary rocks are really difficult to date. Um, because oftentimes what that, uh, that, that contact could be is a gap in time. It was not a depositional environment. A depositional environment is an environment that makes rocks. Sediment has to be deposited, right? It could have been a time where weathering was prevalent instead of depositing. In other words, it could have been a time of erasing rocks. All right, that's kind of weird. Let's stop and think about that for a second. Let's go back to the Little Falls exit. If you don't know what that is, it's just cover your lab book, okay? And you may not have ever looked up at the very tippy top of it, but you can imagine the very tippy top of that, that hill right now. There's probably grass growing there, right? And you could, in theory, stand up there and, and throw water balloons at the cars as they drive by on the throughway below. It's, it's a surface, it's a time. It is right now. 
All right. Now, let's jump ahead and let's say that, that Al Gore and all his buddies were right. And, um, and, and unfortunately, they weren't right enough. And that not just are we going to lose Manhattan and Florida, but Hell's Bells, sea level comes all the way into um, Buffalo. Super far. That is now going to start getting deposited on again, right? Some deep sea sediments more than likely because that's, that's fairly far in. Now let's go a couple thousand more years into the future and put that sea back where, I won't say it belongs, but where it used to be. And we've come through and we've made another road cut and we're building another little falls and another Utica. So we need that I-90 to be back in place there. So you're going to have these rocks And then you're going to have that little black line where you used to stand and throw water balloons. And then you're going to have a whole bunch of limestone, let's say, on top. That black line represents thousands and thousands of years where nothing happened. And more so, oh, I actually do have a copy of my lab book, and I never remember how old the rocks are there. Four hundred fifty million years old. So you're going to have a gap. That little black line where you used to stand and throw water balloons is an equals a gap of four hundred and fifty million years, plus or minus a couple thousand. Who cares about a couple thousand when you're dealing with that many millions of years, right? So when you see those little black lines drawn in there, it doesn't necessarily mean something as simple as. Uh, used to be dry, but now it rains a lot, so we got some different rocks growing here. Um, it can mean a, a whole lot more. And that is part of the job of, of being a sedimentologist or stratigrapher, uh, as historical geographer, geographer, good Lord, geologist, um, and uh, part of that job is figuring out that kind of stuff. So an unconformity is a gap in the rock record that represents a gap in time. It's a special kind of contact, okay? It's a special kind of contact that actually is a gap in time. And it can be a weathering event. I didn't even make our story problem that complicated. We could throw in Mother Nature wearing down, and we could throw in another ice age and plow off a half a mile of rock and then put some more down. Or a period where there just wasn't any deposition, which is where we currently are now. The top of that hill is a weathering environment. It's not a depositional environment. The bottom of that hill is not a depositional environment, so on and so forth. It's just we're in a weathering time. Questions? Let me see something real quick. All right, we're going to go a few more minutes just because I'm sort of already talking about this. All right, so rocks and time. Beds equal time. I've said that to you. I've said it several times. Rocks equal time. Layers equal time. Um, the beds must have been exposed to the surface um, for sedimentation to occur, right? And keep in mind, the surface can be underwater. The surface isn't always where you could stand, be dry, and breathe. The surface of the earth is also the bottom of the ocean. Just for clarification there. So sedimentation occurred, time is indicated by the presence of those rock layers, those beds. <coughs> Seems simple enough, all right? 
the problem is, is you can't always tell when somebody ripped a chapter out because it could just be a thin black line. Somebody ripped 12 chapters out. Happens in your lecture book, you're going to notice a big gap. Happens in the rock record, you can graze right over it. So I've been talking about this also nonstop. All right, limestone, shale, and sandstone over and over again. We've got our little bricks. Remember, we learned the bricks. We've got our dashed lines. We learned the dashed lines, and we've got our dots. So in this short little diagram that we have here, I realize it's kind of small for you guys in, in class here. Uh, what's on the bottom there? What's the oldest rocks? Limestone, then we go shale, then we go sandstone. Okay, good. And now I, without this in front of you, have explained this to you many times as a, a stereotypical marine progression. All right? You got your sand, that's the beach. You got your shale, that's the mud. If you could walk far enough off, Till you get sand, most of us would be way above our heads, though. We don't can't do it, but it's there. You've experienced this if you've ever swam in a lake. Lakes, it's easier to hit the mud. You know, waves and stuff to, to, to keep things smoother longer. But, you know, like if you're out at your buddy's lake or some state park or whatever, and it's kind of nice where they've manicured, and then you get out too far and it turns into that muck. All right? It's the same idea. And then you go out even farther... It stops with the silts and clays, and you're getting, uh, no longer are you getting this, this uh, sediment from the continents coming in and enough to, to actually produce stone, but the biologicals are taking over, um, and uh, limestone's getting deposited as you go into the deeper water, all right? And deeper water also equals a farther out reach. Again, think of this as, as you swimming or, or walking out. But we don't usually see this side by side, right? You don't see this as you're driving down the throughway. You don't see, at least as far as you know, right? You don't see a whole bunch of limestone for five minutes. And then as you go further down, uh, you're still lucky enough to have the road cut. And then you see a whole bunch of shale for another five minutes. And then you go even farther and it turns into um, sand, right? You don't see that horizontally. We always see it vertically. So what you have to do is, is sort of deconstruct that, rearrange it in your mind to this, which is what we were just talking about. And if you move this point back and forth, you could stack, and this is what I don't, I'm, this is a work in progress. I'd have another slide that shows, I skipped over two words, transgression and regression. You see those? We'll come back to them in a minute. We can show a transgression where the shoreline moves forward and we would stack your shale on top of your sand and your limestone would be on top of your shale. We could then show a regression where there wouldn't be anything here because shoreline moved out to here, and you'd have your sandstone on top of your shale, you'd have your shale on top of your limestone, and you'd have your limestone on top of, well, whatever happened to be over there. But you see how that can make that over time, hopefully, or at least begin to see how that can make that. It's huge amounts of time, and it's, it's a lot of head work. It's a lot of picturing it in your head. If you could stand there in that same place long enough, your ankles would be dry and your ankles would be wet. Your ankles would be dry and your ankles would be wet, or you'd be over your head maybe even. But you've got to be able to be in that one spot for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And that, luckily, is very easy to do for rock.
So again, these marks, these rocks are, are recording time. They're recording history. <coughs> so I, I use these as an example already, but you'll want to take a moment and, and write them down. Um, transgression um, means moving forward uh, in the regression, because it almost sounds like transgression would be reversing, right? I don't know why to me, it's just aggression, I think, part of it. Um, but it's the regression that's the moving away, moving back out. So if you remember, regression is, is, is going out, transgression is coming in. And these words are used um, in this context with, with shorelines. Okay? There's all this talk, and, and I don't care what side of the political, political argument you're on, and I, I, I don't care. Okay? Or I, I would say I don't know what side you're on, and I don't care what side you're on. Uh, it's not, politics isn't the purpose of this class. And this shouldn't be politics in the first place. Um, sea level changes. We, we know that without question. Okay. Um, now we're just telling you that there are words um, for, for when it comes up onto shore or when it goes back out to, to sea. Not that I will have the free time to draw it between now and the test, but again, I could, in theory, stack some of these, shifting them to the left or to the right, and you ought to be able to tell me whether you're seeing a transgression or a regression. Well, let's see. And I do this to myself all the time, and i got to stop and think. So apply everything you've learned so far today. Well, superposition is all you really need, plus the stuff we just talked about. Is this layer of rock showing you a transgression or a regression? Transgression. And how do you know? Thank you for your honesty. Someone who didn't just get lucky. What do we? What do you know about limestone? I think you do know. Is limestone shallow or deep? All right. You might have went to the bathroom during that part of the conversation. But yeah, limestone is deep. Shale is slightly less deep, and sand is shore. So that one place in time. Remember, superposition tells us oldest rocks are on the bottom. So this one place in time started out as deep water, making limestone. Then that same place in time was shallow water, shallower water, started making shale. And then it was beach. So that tells us that the shoreline is regressing. Shoreline is going out because that was deep water. Now it's just getting your ankles wet. All right? So you weren't right. But thank you for playing. So you got to remember a lot of stuff to cobble that together, okay? But we're at that point. We've been talking about these rocks long enough. It's not about remembering that bricks equal limestone at this point. It's remembering that limestone forms only in the oceans and in fairly deep water. And, and not that dashes are shales, but that shale was mud, and, and mud forms just offshore, and, and so on and so forth. Which is, you know, arguably some things you already knew. So it's just putting that together. All right, and we will end here. You guys have done an awful lot of thinking, and it's the day before Thanksgiving break, so.